Hi, and welcome to the Tomato Timer, a podcast about learning to learn. I'm Zubair from Xenos, and I'm tuning in live with experts from around the world, asking your questions and hearing their stories. All before the timer goes off. 24 minutes and 39 seconds to go. Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 23 of the Tomato Timer. You know that phrase where we say, you know, that's not rocket science. Well, we actually do need to have a rocket scientist this time because the work that she does is across the automotive and space industries. And it's so cool to have you with us today, Bianca. Thank you so much for joining us. Hi, everyone. Thanks to you, Tabar, for inviting me. It's super exciting. So we want to learn more about how you even got to this kind of amazing career thing that many of us just imagine or dream that actually exists. But you've gone through your schooling, your university life, and ended up working with one of the biggest players um, in the space and automotive industries. Um, but your your actual passion started didn't start with space. It actually was with Formula One racing. Is that correct? Yeah, that's absolutely true. Everything actually started, I always say, I'm an accidental rocket scientist uh, because everything just started when I was a little child. And so, first of all, no one in my family had ever heard about rocket science. To be clear, so <laughs> even had a higher education, uh, but um, my dad has always been working in the automotive industry, um, and I love cars. I really love to play with these dirty, oily play- pieces in his garage since I was a child, and because I'm Italian. So I, I grew up in Italy and then I left and I uh, spent now almost 10 years across Germany and, and the UK. Um, I loved the uh, Formula One for, our, for, for, for my family. It was like um, a kind of uh, Sunday ritual uh, during lunchtime. So that this is where all my passion started. This is where I understood. I actually went on the university um, website, started to understand how could I possibly become a, a Formula One engineer? What kind of subjects should I study? And mm. what really was standing out for me was aerodynamics. And for doing that, I had to be an aerospace engineer. So this is where I actually started. And then I went across high education and university thinking about Formula One. So also for my Formula student team, the first one that I founded and so on. But thanks to the skills that I was gaining throughout my whole education outside the university, because I was very curious and not many um, classes were dedicated to such a very niche subject like fluid dynamics. Yeah. Fluid dynamics, then it all went from, you know, being a little child in a garage to actually land a mission on Mars. <laughs> wow. That is a, truly a, a remarkable story. But um, you, you said that even to understand Formula One racing and become an engineer in, in that area, you had to understand aerospace. And what what was the kind of at university, how were you kind of still learning about these different things and how did that link to space what what were the where was the connection um so when uh, when i studied my when i when i started my my master degree in aerospace engineering so like all let's say i think it would be the same also in the uk or everywhere else Mm-hmm. Um, so the the first year actually it's the same for all the different engineering courses so there was a lot of mathematics physics and all the the foundations really for all engineers and then during the second year and also the third year and then when you step to the master degree to to your master studies um you can um i could uh, progressively choose uh different paths so especially for aerospace engineering the three the the three main paths were uh, for me um fluid dynamics structures and then there was another one that was more into instruments so because i actually love the aerodynamics it, it was something that for me also when i was a child because not only i was looking at my dad's job but also at my mom's job and she's a makeup artist so wow she's extremely creative she's also you know does a lot of arts and crafts and with aerodynamics actually i could give colors to the airflow around us something that you know is intangible it's all over mm-hmm. couldn't actually see so when i started um, studying from the foundation i every year i would choose subjects that were more into aerodynamics 
fluid dynamics, um, aircraft uh, aerodynamics, to the point where I got to my master's degree and there was a subject that was uh, hypersonic aerodynamics, which is basically the aerodynamics of re-entry vehicles. And this is where I realized, okay, wow, from cars to re-entry vehicles, the aerodynamics is just getting even cooler. And this is where <laughs> into space actually opened up. I see. Okay, that makes a lot of sense. So it was just the progression and love of understanding fluid and aerospace dynamics that led you to to getting to such a point where you were like, okay, this is the like automotives are cool, but now I've got to the next point, which is like talking about vehicles entering from the atmosphere back into well, not from the atmosphere, from space into our atmosphere. That's crazy. And so now you've got this master's degree, and you've probably are a unique person in terms of what you've studied. You've not many people have been able to carve their kind of educational path as you have. How did it go from there to putting um, a spacecraft on Mars? Um, so, um, because I was always driven by a lot of curiosity and uh, what mm -hmm. important for also to understand for all the students, irrespective of what they do and what kind of stage of their education they are. Um, I kind of have problems with authorities, which means um, I hardly uh, do things according to the guidelines. So I'm always looking for the next thing on my own. So even when I was studying uh, at, at university, as I said, I liked fluid dynamics and I wanted to understand how from a software point of view, how I could possibly do simulations, how I could simulate, for instance, a car in the wind tunnel. Um, so at the time, there weren't dedicated sessions for this. So I would, out of university time, I would actually work and study this kind of softwares, this kind of uh, uh, techniques on my own and I would mm. professors to give me uh, the specific professors to give me more tips or even other students from other different engineering courses um, I would ask them if they were into the same subject if they knew something more about it and so on so I would always go a little bit above or beyond what was required but this is because it was my my passion and i really wanted to understand something that wasn't really available to me at the time during education now it is uh and besides that um i've always wanted to have uh some experiences that were beyond my country as well so i really wanted to look out and go abroad and have experiences that not only were professional but personal that would shape my yeah so this is how actually I got to the, the Mars project. It's because thanks to my uh, outer curiosity and wanting to, to learn something that was more than what I was actually learning at school, um, I managed to land my first internship. It was, at, uh, it was in Berlin, in Germany, the Active Space Technologies, the company was named. Mm -hmm. they, were working, uh, they were actually looking for an intern at the time who had a set of skills for aerothermal fluid dynamics um, of uh, instruments. And this was for a NASA project. So when I saw this, uh, the, the, this, this kind of request coming through uh, by uh, one of my professors, it was in 2013, it was in August summer, I still remember. He had <laughs> Do you know anyone who has this kind of skill set? And I said, yes, that's me, because it was very niche. It was really something yeah. was very specific. So thanks to all of those different experiences, I managed to, uh, to get the intern. And I was one of the few Europeans, actually, to get that internship. And I, in two weeks, I packed up my bags, moved to Berlin, and started working as a first project on the NASA Mars InSight mission. So that was the whole way I went through. Crazy and, and <laughs> terribly amazing story as well. Um, and I think it, it's, it's a perfect question, time for me to ask a question um, from the community regarding internships. So your, almost your whole career and, and life journey began by pursuing the right stuff at university and following your passion, but then pushing really hard to get an internship in the space or in the place a space can be used in two different ways now, but in the in the in the niche that you wanted to be in. So, what sort of tips do you have for students like us and who are who are like kind of thinking about you know getting into whether it's just the kind of space industry or not, but getting an internship and trying to work for large organizations and making kind of uh, 
a significant impact in whatever way in that industry. What what would you think is is important for us to start pursuing at at this age? So uh, first of all, that uh, the way I started was um, actually. Um, asking lots of questions and kind of pestering my professors <laughs> to be completely <laughs> this and this is something that I always tell every student uh, because they were the professors of this habit the subjects I really loved so they could be mm. perfect people uh, to know industries to know what was out there so really this was really my very first reaction i'm going to such and such professor and i'm going to ask them if they know anything besides the usual things that we do at university because clearly they do our professors are 360 degree professionals. So they don't only have ac academic work, but they work for industry. They may be advisor on a board of a bigger corporation. So it's very, very important are asking questions to them. And another thing that I was doing was actually going on the website again, which is available to anyone, of these bigger corporations or uh, agencies, but not only big corporations, because there are a lot of small startups and uh, small or medium enterprises that could have even more interesting uh, approach to, um, uh, to internships. So I would go on the websites, I would start looking for something. Uh, for instance, is there internship here? What, what, were really, what was available at the time? What were the deadlines? How could I possibly apply? So these small things would actually open up a bigger door, as it happened to me. Because then what I said was, okay, um, to my professor, I found this kind of corporation where I want to work. And he started giving me tips about how could I apply, what were the deadlines. And then because he knew I was so interested into getting something into that field, he sent me across the email that he thought it was interesting for me. So start with really asking lots of questions to your peers and especially professors that you uh, really, really uh, value because they will be the first one opening door, doors for you. The one thing I heard through the whole uh, response was the fact that you were super proactive you took matters in your own hand no one told you to to do this or that you went and searched for it and you discovered uh, the way you wanted to go it wasn't uh, and and that's truly amazing and i wish our listeners can kind of like grasp that as as a as the most important skill to learn you know we can learn whatever we want we can go to whatever university we can not go to university as well the thing that really drives us is is our own inner passion it's 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 the fact that we proactively pursue something. And it, well, an example is you, you've gone from strength to strength and you've worked in some of the biggest industries in the world. It's, it's truly remarkable. Um, and then I assume that you've always kept pushing on that to, to go into even further um, projects and companies. Is that correct? Yeah, yeah, that is true because uh, and it is so so great to point this out as as you as you've just said, uh, persistence and curiosity, but also really not being afraid of asking, not being afraid of getting out of what becomes your comfort zone. Because at every stage of our life, then we'll get into another possibly bigger comfort zone. Then. Some of us may be completely comfortable there and don't want to go beyond. Uh, but uh, when you are a person, uh, especially like me, that I'm an innovator, I am really one of those disruptive characters that you need in your company to, you know, change and shift things. Um, this is what happened to me. So um, when I... Uh, I working on the, pro the, the the Mars project and then I started I also had to change my job from the fluid dynamics I changed to the thermal engineering because uh, unless you are working on um, instruments that are landing on another planet which has an atmosphere or they are crossing our earth so that the terrestrial atmosphere there is an air anymore because in the universe in the space outer space there is no air which means there was no fluid to work on so I Hmm. my subject to thermal engineering, which means thermal exchange of spacecraft around the orbits and so on. So from there, I started working actually on these uh, terrestrial missions. So from CubeSat to a little bit bigger spacecraft, payloads, testing a lot, being in the lab, having hands-on experiences, then uh, going to R&D projects, project management. To what stage I realized that my job as an analyst, so working on softwares and also coding at some point, 
I loved it. I learned a lot from it, but it wasn't my personality because I was more of a driver, a people person. So I needed to, mm-hmm. I needed to lead. I needed to, to grow out of that uh, kind of coding or uh, testing uh, engineer, which means... Yeah, but this was your new comfort zone, but you needed to get out of this exactly, as well. Exactly. So I knew that that was done. And also I, I realized that growing up, uh, I, I had other more skills that need, I, I needed to be true to myself. So what happens is that if you keep doing something and then you realize it, it, you feel unsatisfied and if you don't tell that to whoever is, you know, your boss, your manager or whatever, the companies will always try and keep you within the boundaries of the profile that they need. Because it is mm-hmm. that if you don't speak up and say, hey, actually, this is not making me really comfortable. I want to do something else. So you can either find that in the place where you are working. You can either find that in another country. That is what happened to me. So at some point I said, okay, I've lived enough in Berlin. I've done lots of, uh, I gather also personal and professional experiences. I want to do something bigger. I want to work in innovation. I want to be, you know, on a senior position. And this is what happened to me uh, all two and a half ago when I moved to London. And then I applied for a job, which I thought I wouldn't get because I didn't think I was qualified enough because I was extremely young for that role. But actually, because I was going out of my comfort zone again, I got the job and I was one of the youngest product manager in the Airbus Defense and Space when I started. So you never have to be afraid of going that step beyond because it can go well and then you can be happy. <laughs> and so now you we've gone from a very theoretical, analytical kind of rocket scientist working with coding and computers and and working out the specific details about missions and stuff like that to a much more managerial position. You're looking after people who are doing similar things for you. And how has that kind of that change in role, how has that affected you? And are you are you more are you pleased with it? Are you happier in this role? Uh, So I'm definitely happier. It's definitely the change that I wanted. And uh, I'm still seeing now myself changing again. Uh, but in the moment I started the role, I first of all realized how many other skills that were needed because uh, you become, uh, you have to lead teams. Uh, you are working in corporations where you have teams uh, in different countries and suppliers from different states. And yeah. so now the technical was there, which is great, but I need and myself and as a leader first of all because clearly it's very complicated and you need to get all your teams comfortable you need to be very a very good communicator you need to be very very understanding and empathetic at least in my job because developing new products is difficult itself so i needed to become a kind of more entrepreneur rather than what i was before and this is something that is being absolutely great in less than three years i grew and learned so much to the point now that i actually want to be more of an entrepreneur rather than an employee. So again, I'm kind of jumping almost <laughs> for, for, for another time, which is great because you see how much you can grow when you're actually doing something that reflects your personality. So that, it just means that your, your, your exponential growth in, in every kind of personal and, and work experiences is just going to continue to grow as you keep moving out of The next comfort zone you find, you're like, nope, this is not good enough. I'm going to try for something harder. Exactly, exactly. Because you understand that uh, you have the potential. So if you really believe that you can do the next thing and you try it out and then it works, you could also fail. I've failed in many things and from big to small things, but that also was growth. And it made me realize, okay, I needed to fail that thing so that I could do better the other one. And. Mm-hmm. It, it, this is really the story of my life, getting always out of my comfort zone, even from changing countries and integrating into new cultures and finding new houses and finding new friends. This is all part of getting out and not being scared of facing the next big thing. Because the more you do it, the more actually you have learned yourself, you have grown, and the more you can also give back to the community. Absolutely. So I want to start moving into the more general kind of 
feedback and, and thoughts that you have on the current kind of space industry and everything that's happening right now, especially, um, I think it's the, the, the date was moved to today. Is it sometime this afternoon or this evening when that new, that mission from SpaceX is going to go about what, what are your thoughts about the current kind of space industry and where is it going? Uh, so this is very interesting because given also the, the COVID situation and, and all of that, actually the space technology is becoming even more relevant because thanks to telecommunications, space, spacecraft, we can actually have broadband internet way, which means we can actually stay safe at home and work from home, something that wouldn't happen without space technology. Having space explorations and going beyond what's been done at the moment, for instance, the docking of two astronauts to the International Space Station, mm -hmm. the ISS itself is one of the biggest lab that we have and the only one we have in space where you can actually grow experiments that could give you faster outcome rather than experiments that we have on Earth. So I think that the more we are moving towards this very digital virtual world, which is needed, is making us safe and is also making us work more efficiently, the more we need space technology to, to be thriving. And has the, the obviously we, we heard a lot on news about uh, how Elon Musk was kind of contenting the, the kind of governmental regulations to bring his workers back to the factory. How has the current situation affected your work and what are you, are you still able to do stuff? Um, is it getting difficult or, or what does it all feel like? Um, so this is a good question because yesterday I just had uh, with uh, one of my uh, senior colleagues same conversation and we've both realized that actually our efficiency has grown because we are you know giving uh, in into this formalism or meetings and emails and everything and everything is just happening through phones phone calls is getting way more the communication is sharper and faster so actually we are being more like friends rather than for colleagues which means that we can move faster into projects and also have the human uh, aspect of it and it's really it's really working fine i'm working from home since march nothing has changed if anything i'm even working more so i think it was a good shift for humanity to really understand that we can be remotely working flexible if we are mothers if we are fathers that need to have kids and so on i think it's the shift that we all needed yeah, it's definitely shifting and uh, changing a lot of the status quo and, and things we thought were like fixed into foundations that we could never move. And suddenly all of those kind of foundational pillars are being shifted by this virus. Um, and some for the better, I think, including work from home and, and the culture around that, but also educational wise as well. We're seeing lots of really amazing improvements. Now, I want to take it back to the first time I actually met you, which was at the Royal Institution. It was it feels like an age ago when I was yeah. out and about, but we were we met at the 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 London Mayor's Scientist Program with STEM UK, and that's where I was. It was I was lucky enough to to be in your group, and we we talked about everything regarding kind of impassioning students with the STEM subjects, but not just that, but in particular um, in the importance of diversity and inclusion in 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 all industries, and specifically the challenges we face in STEM. So. I know that you're a huge champion for females in STEM, but also specifically in, in a very like targeted niche of, of space for women. Um, how does that, how, what are your feelings about that? And what would you like to share with us? Uh, so the, uh, what I want to share is that um, I've, Given given the, the, the journey that I had, uh, coming from a place where none of my um, parents were engineers in the first place, no one really knew what was rocket science, um, I wasn't really coming from one of the favorable background as well from the southern of Italy, was quite kind of still narrow-minded when I... Mm not many girls in the field. Um, I also was not a very advantaged financially speaking because I was having some major issues during my education. So what I wanted to share with the other girls, especially when they are facing all of this different discrimination for one reason or to another one, is that rocket science scientists don't necessarily look like the crazy scientists that they see as a stereotype. So you can look like a normal girl, you can have a social life, you can, and, and yet 
yet work for mass projects, yet being, you know, very, very professional, because this is what generally uh, happens to me. When I go into schools for workshops and they have been announced a rocket scientist is coming in, then they look at me and they're like, wow, you are the rocket scientist. I would never think of. So <laughs> this is the shift that I really want to happen. And also because uh, at, at Airbus, um, a couple of summers ago, we have shadow works. So this is also very important, shadow works for a couple of weeks for high school students. They could shadow some of the professional and see how everything is working. And one of, the, one of those students was a girl, she was 16. And she said, I love everything that you were doing. I would really want to become a physicist, but I feel out of place. And I said, don't have to, you don't have to feel out of place. Look at me. I will, I will feel out of place every day, but it doesn't really matter. So what I thought is that I never actually had a role model at the time uh, when I was studying or during my, my journey as a, as a professional. So I had to go through these different discriminations, you know, and the subtle harassment and the jokes about the looks and everything on my own. And I said, this has to stop. I want, I want the other girls that if they want to become rocket scientists or whatever they want to do in space, which is a very difficult and specific uh, industry, I don't want them to feel alone as much as I did feel when I was a student. Wow, I, it's such a beautiful message. And it's also right on time because we are at the end of our Pomodoro. It's Italian. Yeah, it's Italian. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, I can say it without um, with the other person understanding. Thank you so much for joining us. I th I'm sure that I'm left speechless and inspired. I'm sure you've left our listeners like that too. So thank you so much for your time. Thanks for you. It's been a pleasure. And thank you to all our listeners. Um, that's it for today. And we'll be back next week with another awesome guest. Um, bye for now. And that's another episode of the Tomato Timer. If you'd like to ask your questions and join us live next week, join the Xenos Discord server. The invite link is in the description. And to learn more about Xenos and how a bunch of students are on a mission of making quality education accessible to all, go to xenos.org. Bye for now.